I thought I'd just kick off with a few questions from me, and we will make time at, at the end for questions from the audience. So have a think about what you might want to, to ask Anton. Um, but I thought I'd just start to ask you to talk a bit more about how you got involved, because am I right in thinking you, you signed up thinking, oh, I might be a deckhand if I'm lucky, and that sort of escalated yeah. pretty quickly? Yeah. Um, I, I'd spent a, a few years delivering yachts and small commercial craft sort of um, for, for people um, around the world. And that sort of eventually ended up with going to work for an oil company effectively, but as a, an oceanographer off the west coast of Greenland measuring icebergs. Um, and this was in, in an area where they were drilling for oil and they wanted to keep the icebergs away from the oil rigs. So my job was to monitor the movement of the icebergs and sort of raise a flag and alarm and, and say that that iceberg is likely to hit the oil rig. And then the, the little ship I was on would try and tow the iceberg away. And I was quite you know, taken by icebergs. I thought they were rather interesting. Um, so when I, when I finished doing that, um, I heard about Ram Fiennes. And I'd heard about his expedition. Uh, and I thought his name was Ron, not Ram. So I, I wrote to Ron uh, and said that um, knowing about his expedition, and I knew it was around the world, so obviously there was a ship, there had to be. Um, I said, could I join his ship as a deckhand? And I got a letter back saying that he'd be pleased to meet. So I went to the army barracks, which was shown at the beginning of the film, and met him. And um, he was a bit cagey about this ship. And, <clears throat> and eventually he came out with it. He said, look, um, we haven't got a ship. Um, we haven't got any money, to be honest. Um, and we haven't got any crew. Uh, and we haven't got any food, we haven't got any stores, we haven't got any fuel, we haven't got any... Uh, the planning of where the ships would go around the world and the ports and getting in and out of them and so on. Um, yeah, no, if you can do that, um, and as long as it doesn't cost any money, obviously, uh, then, yeah, no, no, you can, you can certainly be a deckhand on, on, on the ship. <laughs> um, so that's how I got involved, and <clears throat> miraculously. And I have to say, we're talking 40 years ago, over 40 years ago, it was easier then than it would be now. I mean, getting that sort of support. Um, <clears throat> my family had owned one or two quite famous polar ships, um, the Terra Nova being one of them. And so I went to the family who were big insurance brokers and asked them if they would sponsor the ship. And they were adamant that they wouldn't. Um, and I'd found one or two ships were quite small and quite cheap and they, they wouldn't touch them. And eventually I, I found a ship in Canada, which was perfect for our needs. But it was um, two million Canadian dollars. So I went back to the family business and I said, actually, I found the per it's a bit more expensive than the others, but it's perfect. And they sort of said, well, you know, we've already said no. Why would we change our mind? And luckily, an American company, Marsh and McLennan, who wanted to take over my family's business but hadn't said so, they said, we'll do it if you'll do it. And so my family's company, Bowerings and Marsh McLennan, hence all that writing on the side of the ship, which I used to find quite embarrassing because it's... Un, not, very, not very attractive to have your name written all over the side of a ship. Um, but they did join forces and bought the ship for us. It's quite ahead of its time <coughs> in a sort of branding <coughs> sense, isn't mm. it? All the sponsorship and everything. Absolutely. Um, I, I wanted to make sure we talked a bit more about, about Ginny Fines, yeah. who sadly died in 2004, mm. because she, she describes herself as, oh, I'm just a housewife, which obviously couldn't be further from the truth. So. Do you want to say a bit more about yeah, Ginny's contribution um, to this and other Well, it, it, it was Ginny's idea, um, and she was a absolute tour de force in the, in the planning and execution of it. Um, <clears throat> in, in the sense that she said, I'm just a housewife. I genuinely think that's sort of how she saw herself. She had no particular ambition for herself. She did for Rang, huge ambition. Because I think she saw in him, you know, a, a truly remarkable person. And, of course, they'd known each other for a very long time, since they were kids. She was incredible, because she, in order to be on the expedition, she had to have a role. And she didn't, uh, there was nothing specific 
unless you took on something quite bold, like become the head of the base camp. And, and it was an incredibly important role. It was a sort of safety net in a way. So she learned to be a radio operator. And that's not an easy thing to do, because you have to learn Morse code, you have to learn how to use a Morse key, you know, da 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 uh, She had to work out, she had to learn about the sort of technology of radio telephones. She, her machine in Antarctica was a, it won't mean much to you, I don't suppose, but it was a one kilowatt transmitter. So it was, it was the size of a large fridge. And it could broadcast from Antarctica all the way back to here. Not always easily, because the airwaves were quite complicated, but she mastered it, and she could do it. And, and there was never a point in the expedition when Ginny wasn't completely in control of providing the backup, which is tough for her, because her husband was out there floating around on ice floes, risking his life. And she was trying to egg him on, but also provide the backup. She was, she was remarkable. And she was awarded the Polar Medal <coughs> late, later by the Queen, wasn't first she? First woman to, to be, yeah. And, exactly. and the Royal Geographical <coughs> Society now have a, a hut based on her Antarctic design in their garden. Exactly. In her, in exactly. her honour. So, yeah. Um, yeah, really no, she, she was a huge part of the expedition, and later expeditions mm -hmm. too. Although she didn't always take part in the later expeditions because they ended up living in Exmoor. They had a herd of Aberdeen Angus cows and she took up farming. But she was just the most amazing support behind Ran, um, and sort of sort of egged him on. In a, in a, in a, he would have gone on these expeditions anyway. But she wanted him to know that she was entirely behind him, uh, and she was, and she absolutely was. She was hugely proud of him. And you mentioned at the beginning in your introduction about the importance of, of film to kind of often mm. funding these mm. expeditions going way back to the sort of heroic age. Yeah. That's very much something we're marking with this, this season, this sure. month. And mm. you, you saw a snippet of the Shackleton Endurance Expedition film, mm. which is called South, and we're actually re-releasing that. So a bit of a plug, mm. plug there. There's a big, big screening at the IMAX next week. Um, with a newly commissioned score, so I'd, I'd really urge you to catch that BFI restoration because um, that's going to be doing the rounds again. Um, but Ran himself was a bit of a dab hand with a cine camera, wasn't he? Yeah, he, yeah. You saw him actually there, didn't you, with his 16 mil? Yeah, no, camera. Ran had a good eye, very good eye, and very good uh, photography as well. Um, I mentioned at the outset that that there was a, there's this sort of slight problem with filming. In this case. It was an extraordinary combination because, I mean, you could see that, uh, yes, I mean, some of it had to be filmed in a particular way, which wasn't as, as raw and as live as you might expect nowadays. The camera equipment was massive. And Mike Hoover and Beverly Johnson, who I mentioned at the outset, they had to lag, lug all that camera equipment. But the rule with them was at the start of the expedition, you can film the expedition, you can come on the expedition, but you have to be completely self-sufficient. You have to bring your own food, you have to bring your own clothing, tents, everything, everything that they needed. Um, they had to be able to get to wherever they had to get to without being a burden on the expedition. Quite often, uh, the ship was either going there or the aircraft was, so, so they could hitch a ride, and they did. But generally, they had to be totally self-contained. and. Because they were tough, and because they could handle this quite hefty equipment, um, and they didn't sort of make any burden on, on Ran and Charlie um, as they travelled, particularly in the Arctic, um, they all got on really well. And I think actually, in a way, if you think of the film crew having to sort of run ahead a bit and film them coming towards them and then run back the other way and film them going away, having to charge their batteries, having to change film, celluloid film in the, in the magazines on the cameras and things like that. A really complex problem and, and masses of kit, which they had to pull on their sledges. So th they were incredible. And they had huge respect from all of us on the expedition. And that made the film better because the uh, expedition members were more pliable and more able and, and happy to be film. But the thing I love is the, is the sort of charming innocence of the expedition members in front of the camera. There's no macho sort of, you know, big sort of hoo-ha. It's all wonderfully sort of nuanced stuff, 
which was not at all contrived. It's just you, you have to look at the members of the expedition, and I'm not talking about us on the ship's crew, because we were obviously very normal people, but the people <laughs> on the ice were just wonderfully quirky, and completely naturally so. Uh, and as a result, you know, Rand's never had a TV show, you know, that he's never been the sort of presenter of television, because it's just not the person he is. He's a very low-key, very... Um, he's a, a brilliant expeditioner, very tough, very driven, um, but also wonderfully sort of just himself. He's, he's very eccentric, and I think that's what makes him so glorious. Well, I, I'm, of course, not a filmmaker myself, so I can't overly... Um, I'm not overly qualified to advise on how to make the film. <clears throat> the, the, the most important thing on all these expeditions, and Rand said it in, in the Trans Globe film there, is um, that the team that you pick to go on an expedition, the people who are going to be involved, um, need to be very easygoing people. Um, it, it, we were lucky. I mean, we, we, three years on the ship, there were 16 of us in all. Um, a couple changed, but the rest stayed for the three years. And it was because we all got on. We, you know, there, there weren't sort of egos to worry about. Um, I mean, we did it so that there was no expertise in actual fact. Um, you know, nobody had been to Antarctica before who we went down with the ship. I mean, you imagine, we had 1,900 sponsor companies throwing, you know, so much money at the expedition because it was a very ex expensive expedition. We'd never been there before. I had no idea what to expect, really. Um, and um, so there, there wasn't a great de degree of expertise, but there was a lot of sort of good humor, uh, and, and that really, really counted for a huge amount. Charlie Burton, you could not pick a nicer guy. I mean, just the easiest, loveliest man. Ollie Shepard, exactly the same. So Rand had picked people very well. All I, all I can say is going on an expedition I would definitely pick people who are easygoing. They can learn a skill, but you can't learn to be an easy person, I think, is, is, is the truth. So that, that's, that's the first thing. Looking for um, endurance is a fascinating thing. They, they tried a few years ago um, to no avail because they lost the, <clears throat> the drone. Um, yeah, it'd be amazing if they can find it. I mean, I think it's known more or less where the ship is, and they've worked out how it's drifted and so on. So it, 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 it is possible that they could find it. It's funny that literally the last two days, I had an inquiry from someone who wants to know about the insurance, because did Shackleton make an insurance claim? <laughs> There are no records. I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm looking into it now to find out whether there was an, and if there was an insurance claim, how much was it? And who does the insurance money belong to? And, and you know, was there perhaps not an insurance claim, and should there have been, and so on? Um, I don't know why this person's particularly interested, anybody is. Um, <laughs> I think that would be probably harder to find out than the, actually finding the ship itself. <laughs> but, uh, no, I wish Dan and the team... Great success. You know, I hope it goes well. Um, it'll be fascinating to find the ship. There are no bodies with that ship, so it isn't, in a sense, a grave, you know, because clever Shackleton saved everybody, and they all got home, including one man who had a heart attack. Um, so, so, you know, they, the, the ship is there to be, to be discovered, really. And Rand's latest book is all about Shackleton. It's all about Shackleton, yeah, yeah. The centena of his <coughs> death is really why we're doing this, yeah. you know, this season, mm. the end of that heroic age, so. Mm. Yeah, and he went down, and then they pulled his rope up, because otherwise it would show. <laughs> so he had to sort of brace himself like this, and film Rand. And Ram was kicking snow, and you know, there's a, there was a snow bridge to one side. I mean, it could have collapsed. Um, yeah, Mike Hoover went down the hole. Uh, I mean, it, inevitably in a film like this, the, f the film crew weren't there all the time, so they um, had to do some recreation. So that something like that was a recreation. They actually planned it, but it completely fitted what happened. 
Same is true in the Arctic, when Rand Skidoo goes through the ice um, and disappears. Um, he amazingly agreed with the, you know, with the, 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 the director who was out with us then, because we had the ship there as well. He said, you know, if you want me to, I'll, I'll drive a Skidoo in, into the ice. And so he sat on this thing, drove it along, and poof, and went down the hull. And I have a photograph. I actually brought it with me, but it's a slide, and I can't show it. But it, it, th there are about 20 of us on the end of a rope trying to pull the sledge and skidoo back out of the hole because we didn't want to lose it, um, which we did manage to do. And the engineers on the ship got it going again within about half an hour. Oliver Shepard, poor Ollie, uh, I say poor Ollie, I mean, he had a choice, and I guess this is life, isn't it? Um, he, he was married. He was, apart from Ran and Ginny, he was the only one who was married and, until Charlie got married. Um, and Ollie's wife didn't like him being in, in such a sort of perilous situation. And she basically said, you've got to come home. And he thought, uh, keep the marriage going and everything else, that that is what he should do. And uh, it, it was a, a hell of a decision for him. He loved the expedition. He stayed with it all the way through. I mean, unfortunately not in the field, but he was in the London office and he, he uh, was, was ever present, um, helping with the sponsors and helping with publicity things and things like that. But he wasn't in the field. Um, and he's been so close to it ever since. Uh, the trust, Transweb Expedition Trust, which we now run, which supports people wanting to go on expeditions where there's a sense of purpose, where they can uh, perhaps do some science or um, do work on it in a humanitarian way or something like that. Um, Ollie was a sort of founding trustee uh, and still is and he, he, he adores the whole memory of Transglobe um, and, and is still very very much involved. How do you step out, step back into some semblance of normal life after you've been part of something so sort of all, all consuming? I think it's very very difficult. Um, I think we all came back thinking we would be employable which is pretty bizarre when you think about it. Um, I certainly thought I might get a job. Um, I didn't. Um, <laughs> Ran just carried on. Charlie Burton got a job in security. Um, but poor Charlie died in 2002, you know, quite young, in his, in his 50s, I suppose. Um, Ginny ran the farm uh, until she died in 2004. Members of the crew basically all went off and did, did get jobs. Not one, not one, yes, one, uh, went back to sea. The rest of them all went ashore. They were professional seafarers too, so that was, that was slightly unusual. Um, when we came back from the expedition, I uh, stayed with Ginny because we had a debt. Although we weren't supposed to spend any money, uh, some money had been spent, and there was 106,000 pounds. You know, it's a lot of money in those days. Uh, and so Ginny and I worked in the office raising money. Uh, we, we sold a lot of kit at Camden Lock, and Eric, who used to do the man behind Camden Lock, is here, and he supported us in those days and has done ever since to you know, get, re recover that 106,000 um, pounds. And we did it. We got all the money back. So that took another year and a half, I suppose. And then since then, I've never really, I, I haven't been able to get a job. Um, <laughs> I have a removal business, but I, I don't get too involved in it because I'm, I'm distracting apparently and uh, they're, they're better off at running it themselves. So, um, so yeah, I don't know, it, it's a difficult one. Uh, what do you do? Um, retire gracefully, I suppose. <laughs>
So they made this film, and then it was shown, I think, once in the States. It was shown once by Central Television um, here. I think actually twice. They, then they did a cut-down version of it. It's hardly ever been seen, uh, and it is extraordinary because it is, I mean, it is an unusual film. It's an unusual sort of construction of a film, I think, because it does have that sort of grand, it costs one and a half million dollars to make, which is about six million dollars of today's money. So it's a very expensive film to make. Um, and, and it was never, so I'm, I mean, I'm thrilled that, you know, it's getting an airing now. And I have no doubt one day it'll be in the vaults of the yeah. BFI. Well, we have got, we've got Rand's sort of personal copy of it yeah. as part yeah. of his collection of the BFI. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah. preserved and... Absolutely. And, and thank you for loaning your, mm. your, your copy for tonight because I think it, it looked beautiful. Mm. God, I, I, I can tell you. Um, <laughs> They, when we left the team in Antarctica, we came back to Cape Town, and it was a it was a real worry because we had actually no nothing to do until they crossed Antarctica and we went around the other side. Um, the ship was obviously a very expensive item for the expedition to have, and we, we you know we had to try and raise money whenever we could. My fear was that the crew would disperse and we'd never get them back, and then we'd have to do a massive recruitment. They were not happy to go trading. I mean, they were all merchant seamen. They could go off on much more comfortable ships uh, and have a, you know, be paid and do do all of that without um, uh, without the hassle, if you like, of, of uh, sort of being with our little smelly old ship, which was quite hard work to to keep going. So we took on this charter, and it was to go from Fiji to Samoa, and then around the, the, a group of, of very small islands, the Tokelau Islands, which are a tiny little group of atolls in the, in the sort of central Pacific, and then up to uh, what, what were called the Gilbert and Ellis Islands, now called Kiribati and Tuvalu. Again, tiny little atolls, and our job was to take supplies out to them and take passengers from one island to another. And it was very hard work, and it was extremely hot. Um, and I know that and in my performance in this, I know it's never going to win an Oscar. Christ. Um, <laughs> and there's me saying, rather sort of glibly, you know, oh, we're longing to go somewhere cold. And the next shot is that everybody sort of freezing to death. Um, but we did quite want to go somewhere cold, because no, there was no cooling on the ship. There was no air conditioning. It was, it was built for polar work, so it was sort of, everything was electric and hot. And, um, and it was quite uncomfortable. But it was glorious, and in ref, in, on reflection, probably the best part of the expedition for me. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. And, and uh, I didn't have any worries. I didn't have resp expedition responsibilities for that period. So for me, it was easy. For the rest of the crew, it was a bit tougher, but I loved it. Thanks, Anton. I think on that note, unfortunately, we are going to have to wrap up. We could go on with hearing these stories for a lot longer. But thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for thank coming. You. Thank, thank you, Anton. Thank you.